Hello, my name is Trey. Welcome to What Got to Change. Today, we're going to be talking about obsession. Sorry, got a little uncontrolled there. All right, let's go ahead and watch this video. And I'm going to, I have a, quite a few of things I want to talk about here. Let's go ahead and get this move forward a little bit. This is Ryan Terry, uh, Olympian, men's physique. Let's go. I to explain it. I'd... I always felt like I was overweight. I've never been entirely uncomfortable in the early days of, of how I, I look and feel. People on the outside will look at you and go, how? Like, how is he gonna have body dysmorphia? Like, what, I mean, can you explain what body dysmorphia is and how it made you feel? Yeah, so even to this day, it sounds silly, but I've got a vest on to, to film with you today, but I train in hoodies, I train covered up. I'm not someone who walks around with a top off or anything. I, I, I compete on stage with my top off and that's it. The rest of the time I'm covered up and stuff because I, I don't do this sport really for, for anyone else other than for, for my confidence and for me to feel okay. And that's why I probably train the way I do. That's probably why I put myself through what I do is, is to, to keep that at bay. But I'm in a good place with it, but at the time, um, obviously coming into it, there was, yeah, a lot of what I see in the mirror is different to what everybody else sees and my way of dealing with that is, is training, uh, eating well and feeling good on the inside and on the outside. The reason I wanted to show you that part <clears throat> is because, look, so many times we see people with nice bodies, nice genetics, pretty privilege, all this kind of stuff, and we don't realize that a lot of people have these insecurities too. Some people aren't doing it for you. I think that we as a society sometimes, I ain't saying that because it sounds so weird, but we do as a society times, we see people who are really good looking. We see people who have nice bodies. We see people who are at the gym a lot, or we see people who really take care of themselves and the way they eat. And we think they're not having fun. We think that they're um, miserable. They're the worst people on the planet. You can't believe that you would ever do that. And I said this in the last video, but I'll say this again. A lot of people, a lot of you guys don't have the discipline to do this. Me, myself, I'm trying to get disciplined now um, and trying to really change myself. It's hard, right? It takes a lot of discipline to do this stuff and not look as everything is supposed to be fun. It's hard not to look at food and think it's fun. It's hard not to look at the gym and not think it's hard. He mentions later on in here that he says that I just go to the gym because I love it. Whether he was doing the Olympiad or not, he would still go to the gym because he, it's just a part of his life and he loves doing this. And that's why he doesn't go around showing off his body. Even though he's a good looking man, that's not his purpose. He does this because he wants and enjoys and loves it. But I think all of us make everything about us. And so when we see somebody like this, we think, oh my gosh, this person is so conceited. And he's this, he's that. I bet he gets all these women. I bet he's an asshole. I bet he's this. It's just... Stop making it personal all the time. Some people do get obsessed with what they do, but the, you see obsession as such a bad thing because you don't have discipline to do anything. You're not obsessed with anything but eating Cheetos in the basement. You know what I'm saying? You're not. You're only obsessed with playing video games that you're not even good at. You're obsessed with trying to make money even though you have zero skills. That's an obsession. That's bad obsession. There's a difference between having an obsession and it's leading to a better life and leading you to be competitive in some form or fashion and making some sacrifice for your family because you're obsessed with making your family better or obsessed with making everybody a life around you better. He talks a lot about how his son became one of his became one of his main motivations. I'm just saying, just think about it sometimes. Don't think everybody is just out here uh, trying to be evil just because you can't do it. If I didn't mention this, by the way, this is by the Mulligan Brothers. I'm sure y'all have seen their channel, uh, the Mulligan Brothers. The name of the documentary, as you can see up here, To Be the Best in the World, Inspiring Body Documentary. You can just probably type in Ryan, Ryan Terry and the video will come up. But it is the Mulligan Brothers, so check them out. And speaking of checking out, don't forget to check out that subscribe and like button if you want to. Go ahead and give it a click. All right, let's continue. I think this part is very good about staying motivated. Everyone always asks me, like, how do you stay motivated 24-7? And I'm only human, like, you can't be fully motivated 24-7, but I'll always turn up to my session and give it my everything on that day. What drives me is knowing that I'm not number one in the field that I'm working at. So for me, until I'm Mr. Olympia, that drive and that passion every day, would the competitors who I'm up against be welching out on this set? Will they be moaning about this is hard or if they're hungry and stuff? And, 
These type of things in my head just flick the switch and I'm like, no, I'm, I'm the guy who has to work harder than everybody else, uh, be in the trenches and, and graft and, and that's how I've always been. Slow motion going on. When you, you you feel like you've got no more reps in you and stuff, and then you take yourself to that dark place where not a lot of people talk about it, but a lot of like say greats, but a lot of people who train savagely or hard, they put themselves in them horrible places where. I want to talk about that right quick. <clears throat> What's going on, my voice? Hello. Putting yourself in a dark place, you know, and I was talking about this the other day. Um, not to you guys, but uh, talking to a buddy. One thing I used to be able to do very well, and I'm getting back to it. It's taking it's taking me a long time uh, since last year, but to go into that dark hole, that place where it is, and I I know this is gonna sound morbid, and it is morbid, but I remember I used to work out so hard. I would because you know I'm from Texas. I used to go outside in the Texas heat. As hot, I would pick the hottest part of the day. And I would go outside and I'd work out, had a little sun hat on, and I would just go to work. And it was to the point where I didn't care if I lived or died. I would push myself until it felt like sometimes I was going to pass out. It was so hot. I did not care. I wanted to fill that dark hole. That's why you hear some men will do some of the craziest thing to get that adrenaline rush, to just get that feeling of some men just need it, you know. Not too long ago, June, as y'all know, shoe on head, said that some men will crawl through glass for a purpose. It's the truth. Some men will do anything. They'll take the pain. They'll take everything to get to where they need to get, especially if they're doing it for their family. They don't care how it ends. And I think that's what makes the difference is what happens when somebody becomes, really, they come face to face with the mortality. You got two routes you can go. Because you realize one day you are going to die and you can either die peacefully sometimes in your bed or it can be a tragic end for you, something you never saw coming. And I think that when you can get to a place of when you are working out or when you're doing something else in life, you're a firefighter, you're a policeman, something like this. When you just think to yourself, I'm just going to give it my all. I don't care what happens. Not to say you're reckless. But it's to say that every day I wake up with something and I'm going to give my all to make sure my family eats even after I'm dead. You know, I'm going to make sure everybody's life around me was better. I don't care how I have to do it. If I die in the process, and this, I'm sorry to be morbid here, but if I just go into cardiac arrest from working out too hard or if I go into this or my heart just stops, something happens, I lose my limbs, I don't care. Will I be sad? Of course. Will I be depressed? Of course. When I get to when I'm finally looking into the light and my life is slowly ending, am I going to be scared? Of course. But at the same time, the worst feeling in the world is to die for nothing. It's one thing if you're living your life with as much purpose as you can and your body gives out. Something happens tragic and you die. It's a whole nother thing to be 80 years old. And you die and you were so scared of dying. You were so scared of sacrificing. You were so scared of doing anything that you die at 80 years old and you didn't do anything. You didn't sacrifice for your family. You just worked. I'm not saying working a nine to five is bad. I'm saying, but you worked at your nine to five and never did anything outside of that. Right. You never went to go help at your local shelter. You never did anything to spend more time with your kids. You didn't do anything to spend more time with your wife. You didn't do anything to try to make anybody's life better. You decided every time you came home, you sat in your bubble where they meant sitting on the recliner, sitting in your man cave. And you just did nothing. You didn't work out. You just got fat. You just tried to make life as easy as possible. You were so scared of death. Death had you so scared that you ended up doing nothing. And you had 80 years to get something done, but your fear ate you alive. A man 
who fears suffering is already suffering from fear. Bodybuilding is a very selfish sport and if you want to be the best in the world at it, you have to put your food, your sleep, your rest, your training before anything, before family, friends, all that kind of stuff. I've got a vest on to, to film you today, but I train in hoodies, I train covered up. I'm not someone who walks around with a top off or anything. This is just where that part you heard earlier in the show came from. Let's move forward a little bit here. The name for myself over there, and a lot of people- I think this story is very interesting about what a lot of us hear when we go through life. This is such a great story that he tells said that was never gonna happen. Like you just won't do that over there. And it, sure enough, it, it was really hard. No one remembers the early days, but I got over there coming off an Arnold Classic win, buzzing, I was only 12 weeks post-show, so I was in the best shape of my life. Went over there, did my first show in California, Culver City. I placed dead last, they didn't even um, pull me out on, they put the masters in front of me, because there's only like three or four masters, they put them in with our class and everybody got a comparison bar me. I went to the guy after, I went to the head judge, because I was gutted, mortified, really upset, on a proper downer, and me and my coach were like, that was it. This guy said, go and get some feedback and find out what it was, why they didn't call you. As I went to him, he looked me up and down, and he just went, we don't want this over here, like that doesn't work. Your physique, nothing works over here. And I was like, well, what do you take, what, how, do you, how do you take that? And I walked off and we kind of said that was it. And I always remember this guy, don't, I don't know his name and I'd love to shake his hand one day, but he, I was going to In-N-Out Burger <laughs> and he, he ran up to me, he said, Ryan, Ryan, he said, don't get disheartened by this. He said, it's only your posing, you're too hard posing over here. He said, go to the West Coast, uh, go to the East Coast, Steve, Bev's gym, that type, they like, they prefer more hardcore, but he said, you'll suit that better. So I was like, right, they like more like flamboyant kind of posing on the, on the West Coast. And uh, sure enough, three months later, I went to um, Miami, I won Miami, won Pittsburgh Pro, won uh, Atlanta, so back to back. So I won three shows back to back and it took me to Olympia that year. So yeah, there's, there's pivotal moments where you just think, I, I would have probably called it a day then if that guy didn't came up and said, because I wouldn't have known any different. And nobody over there acknowledged me or my coach, we were nobodies over there. It's hard as well because I've been so close so many times, I've not, not beaten any of them. So I've, I've beat every single one of them in the time. Like Brandon Hendrickson, who's three times Mr. Olympia now, before my injury, we went toe to toe every time and he never beat me. And it's, just, it's, it's hard because I took a step back, he kept progressing in his career. We've got to make a difference now, we've got to make a change. Bodybuilding is. I want to say this about this man. As, as, like I said, man, as honestly, as good looking as he is, as in shape as he is, as much discipline as he has, he has a beautiful wife, beautiful kid, and he has all this big house, all the money you could think of, right? He sounds like none of that matters to him. He has it, but you can always hear that he's thinking about, man, it's just, I'm just constantly pushing through these mental barriers. I just find it interesting. I just think you should go check out this documentary. But let me say this about the, when he lost, he said he went to a competition on the West Coast, went there after just winning these other competitions. He came over to America and decided, hey, I'm going to do this. And he came over to the West Coast. And guess what? He got dead last. And when he went to them, he said, why did I lose? Can you give me some critique? Um, I mean, why did I get dead last at a point where y'all didn't even call me on stage? And they said, you just can't do that over here. Do what? They didn't give him an answer at all. So he said... He was going to feel crushed until one day he's at a restaurant and somebody says, look, hey, look, I understand um, you think that you're not doing well, but don't let that destroy you. Your problem was your posing. The way you pose over here, it's got to be more flamboyant. It's got to be more flashy. You're doing more hard poses, which meaning he's doing more of the basics, just getting the right poses out of the way. And so they tell him, go to the East Coast. That's what they love over there. He goes over there and he succeeds, makes himself get to the Olympia, the biggest show when it comes to bodybuilding. So 
he easily could have let that crush him. Guys, we all go through stuff where somebody says something to us that absolutely destroys us, right? That says, there's just no way you can make it. You're a failure. You're a complete failure. Don't even try. Just give up. You know, I've had people tell me that in my life. I'm going to be honest with you, though. And this is something that may surprise you. The vast majority of the people that I met, when you say you're a YouTuber, not a lot of people discourage you. I'm being honest. It's, I have not came across a lot of people who say, um, if I say I do YouTube, they go, oh, you should just quit. Now, the difference may be is that my friends don't care that much. The people in my life know that I'm a good talker. They know that I can speak in front of a camera. So they know this is more my lane, right? But there are going to be people who think that you're just stupid. Now, I did have one person in particular that told me that I need to let all this kind of stuff go. I should not do this. I'm going to fail. Nobody makes it in here. And I'm going to be honest with you. I gave up for a little bit. You know, I just thought to myself, and that's why I disappeared from this channel. If you go back and look through all my videos, you'll see I disappeared for almost a year and a half to two years. Because there was a point in my life where I thought, this is just useless. This is stupid. You know, I was lo I loved doing what I was doing. Don't get me wrong. But at some point, you feel like, you feel like you're, you, what you love doing, what, what I love to do is just stupid. I remember I was like, man, I, I love making these videos. They're so fun. But I'm just a dumbass. I'm just, I don't even know why I do this. I love making these videos, but honestly, it's clownish. I need to go do real stuff in this world. And I did. Um, but it, it, no matter how much I've tried in this life, it always brings me back to making these videos. No matter how hard it is, there's something probably in your life. I'm not saying it's YouTube or if it's even something that anybody cares about. There's people who just draw because they love drawing. They never become a famous artist. They don't care. They would do it when there's no money in this. I've obviously made countless videos. This is the only channel you guys have seen. But guys, I've made over two to 3,000 videos and never saw a dime, not a nickel of, of videos. At one point in my life, I made a thousand videos in six months because I just love it that much. That may sound like obsessed to you guys. And that's what I say. What may be obsessed to you is completely different for me. It wasn't even that much of an obsession. I loved it that much. There's people who get up and want to work out and train and keep improving their body. There are people who get up who want to go to McDonald's to make customers smile. There are people who get up who are comedians who love seeing people laugh. There are people who really get up and just love what they do. They cannot help themselves. They cannot help themselves. I could not help myself. If my everything went down and I've had this happen before. This camera disappears. All my PCs at my house explode. My whole house burns down. I probably would find some random phone that I got and I would make a video, right? Obviously, after all that happened, I'd be devastated. It'd take me some time. But best believe after a few months, I might be back on a Samsung Galaxy S2. 240p. But like, um, I don't know how to make it sound bad, but be like, Hey guys, um, don't have a lot going on. Um, some things happened a few months ago, but I'm back. Um, right now I'm living in a studio apartment. Uh, life is kind of hard and all I have is this phone. I know the quality is bad, but I wanted to talk to you guys about a video I watched the other day. You know what I'm saying? It's just like it would never stop. And so I think there is something about having a healthy obsession. Okay, something that just never lets go. And for me personally, making videos... I love that. But what behind the scenes of me making videos is telling you guys all the mistakes I made in this life. So you don't. Okay. Obviously for people who are older than me, they probably don't care what I have to say, but people who are younger than me, who are in their twenties, I love talking to those people because I want to tell them one, you're not a failure just because you're not making millions Two, you're going to screw up, but you got to keep moving forward. And then three, it's just like, don't make the same stupid mistakes I have. If you do anything in this world, just don't do what I did. There's so much, uh, there's a better life out there for you. But if you get caught up in the porn, you get caught up in the women, you get caught up in the drugs, you get caught up in drinking, you get caught up in looking cool, you get caught up in the money, and it just leads to the most destructive. And I was so depressed. I never, I always tell you guys a story of where I was sitting in my bedroom smoking marijuana, looking up at my ceiling, just praying to God at, just to kill me. 
I don't want to take my own life, but I was like, God, you can just kill me. I'm done. And I'm, and I don't want men to get to that place because I was fortunate I could make it out. But other men, they don't. They take their lives, and that's the end of the story. You know, I don't want your story to end like that, where my story almost ended in my 20s. So I'm just saying, I do this because I'm obsessed with helping you guys, and I'm obsessed with telling my story, and I'm obsessed with making y'all's lives just a tad bit better if I can. And if you can go off and do the same damn thing, just take what you have and go teach other young men. If you're in your 20s, go teach the young teenage boys not to get caught up in the foolishness. Because I don't want another man to turn 28 years old, figure out that all of it was for nothing, and he blows his head off. It's, I'm so sick of hearing those stories. I've had friends take their lives, and I just don't want to hear that story no more. I know I will. But if I can just keep another young man from taking his life, I'm here for it. And that's why I do what I do. What are you obsessed about? Put it down in the comments. I'm gone.